Let's pray. Oh Lord, we seek your blessings upon us as we consider your word. We thank you for your word and your guidance as we read and hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, this evening, I'm just going to bring us a few thoughts from this short psalm, Psalm 100. It's described as a psalm of thanksgiving. What a nice title. It's a title that seems perhaps to be derived from the last verse. The verse of the psalm which reads, The Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures for to all generations. Well, we can say there, there's, there's much there for us to be thankful for, isn't there? And the first four verses of the psalm perhaps lead up to this. And, well, maybe really they may be said to explain what is expected of the Lord's people. Expected not just of the nation of Israel, that's the, the nation, the people to whom the psalm was first written but the Lord's people throughout the ages even today and yes even us so what do we understand by these things for which we should be thankful what is meant by the goodness of God what is the mercy of God what is his truth how can we not uh, comprehend something of the goodness of God unless we are, we might say, really hardened atheists? When we just look around, the scriptures in fact tell us that creation itself is enough to uh, assure us of the existence and the reality of God. But does not the sun shine, the rain fall, do not the seasons come and go, and in spite of all the bad news that we hear, do we not see examples of kindness and compassion and love in this world? Yes, the Lord is good. He's good to all, even to those who reject him and despise him. And yes, even they, even those who now despise the Lord and take no notice of what they hear in the scriptures and from Christians speaking to them, <coughs> there will be a day, <coughs> on the day when all is revealed, that the Lord had even been good in giving time for repentance. But they, perhaps, had not bowed the knee, and it was too late. Yes, the Lord is good in withholding the rightful judgment upon this world, so that many may come to repentance. Have you sinned against God? Have you rebelled against him? broken his laws, those laws by which all mankind should live. We all have, I have, all have sinned. And we uh, deserve the just punishment for our sin, that punishment of death in eternity, not a death of annihilation, as some would say, oh well, when it's all over, I won't know anything about it. No, this is a death of eternal separation from God and separation from all his benefits. Yes, those who laugh, those who pour scorn upon the great truths of the Lord will see their error only too clearly when they face the Lord for judgment. But we know 
we know that he is a merciful God. He is rich in mercy. What a wonderful thought. He is rich in mercy, pardoning all who call upon him, who call through the merits of his Son, Jesus Christ, the Saviour. Experience it for yourselves, if you have not. Because not one, not a single one who comes in true repentance to the Lord will be turned away. And that is truth. Yes, his truth endures. And he is indeed truth himself. In this psalm, we've just read that his truth endures, not just for a time, not for your lifetime, not for mine, but for generations. Generations, indeed, for eternity. What we read in the Lord's word is truth. And among the other things that we read in his word is that he is a God of goodness and mercy. And that is truth. So there's no doubt. They're not speculative things. We can indeed be thankful for our merciful God. So let's look further at these four verses. And in those four verses, we also find our responsibility. Now, that's all right, but we may not like to hear that word, oh dear, our responsibilities. Society around us today seems to emphasise far more people's rights than their responsibilities. Responsibilities can be brushed aside. And uh, yes, when considered Seriously, every right that we believe and perhaps know we have carries with it a responsibility. The right of free speech. The right of free speech is one that is widely cherished and indeed Christians are in the forefront of seeking to protect this right, this right of freedom to speak. But it bears an onerous responsibility. A responsibility to be gracious in what we say. Truth, yes, but graciously. The responsibility that goes with freedom of speech is that though hearers may disagree with what is said, or even be upset by what is said, or, dare I say, offended by what is said, or what they hear. It should never be the purpose or the intention of a speaker to offend or harm. But it is also true of our relationship with God. We have responsibilities towards him. We have responsibilities towards the Lord in return for his goodness and mercy. We are told in verses 1 and 2 of this psalm to come before his presence with exuberance, with a shout and with singing. Don't worry, I, I'm not going to ask you all to stand up and give a big shout. That's perhaps not our way of doing things. But if we did do that, it would probably make something of a discordant racket. And that is something condemned by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. There should be order in the church. But equally, the opposite. Deadness. A dead Stoical, doing nothing, either in action, in word, 
or indeed in our hearts, deadness is equally reprehensible. Back in the days when this psalm was written, uh, it was probably uh, culturally an appropriate thing we hear of David and others uh, making much of a joyful noise to the Lord. And yes, it was culturally, <coughs> culturally more acceptable than perhaps in expressing a, a way of recognition, recognition of the king in David, or recognition of the, their gathering to the Lord. All of the people would take part. They would be indicating by their taking part their acceptance of the rule of David, perhaps the king, of submission to his authority and to that of the Lord. It was not disorder. It was not riotous or uncontrolled behaviour. How should we, how should we apply this principle of, of uh, making a joyful noise, of becoming exuberantly toward to the Lord these days? Yes, as we gather together, what should be meant by joyfully demonstrating our recognition, respect, adoration and subjection to him who has been so good to us. Perhaps, let's just think about when we come into this building. When we meet in this building, do we come as we walk down the road or park our car or come in towards the door? Are we anticipating a meeting with the Lord or just a meeting with each other? It's the first and the foremost thing in our minds when we come. I wonder how so-and-so is. I wonder if so-and-so will be there this week. Oh, I must ask about so-and-so. They've not been well and I've been praying for them. I know these are right things in our mind, to be concerned and care about others. But perhaps the first and foremost thing should be, am I going to meet with the Lord this morning in my heart, in my mind? Yes, as I said, it is right to be concerned about the well-being of those that have been perhaps in our prayers during the week. But the principle applies. Is it our desire, first and foremost, to turn our thoughts to our wonderful Lord. Perhaps if you just say the words of verse 3 to yourself, know that the Lord, he is God. What an awesome thing to say. Know that the Lord, he is God. I don't think any of us can fully, with our fallen human, mortal minds really appreciate the majesty of God. You know, even the greatest men of old, men like David and Solomon, men to whom the Lord had revealed something of himself. A little later on, men like Peter, John, Paul, Men who knew the Lord Jesus in his humanity when really confronted with who he really was and is, they fell down as dead men when confronted with his deity. So we are to come. We are to come into his presence. We're not to be, so we say, so overawed with the majesty of God that we say, oh, I can't approach, I'm, I'm not worthy to come, I can't, I shouldn't. We should come, because he has said, come, come unto me. But we are 
to come in the right way. Jehovah, God, said to Moses when he was to confront him at that burning bush, he said, put off your shoes from your feet. You are on holy ground. He didn't say go away, this is far too holy for you, but approach, approach properly. Isaiah thought that he would die because he had seen the Lord. He thought that this would be something that uh, he would never be able to survive. What could he do? What could he say? But he was cleansed. He was purified with a coal from the altar. And both of those two were given the right to approach God in the right way. You know, socially and in this country, uh, I understand that there is a proper protocol if we were to have an audience with or to approach the king. Although I think perhaps Charles is perhaps a little less formal than some previous monarchs, but there is still a proper way that people are told to approach when they are perhaps given an audience or receiving an MBE or something, they're told that there is a correct procedure. Now, people who ignore it, probably, well, today, some may ignore it, and they're not likely to be cast into the Tower of London, but it's still something that if there is a right way of approach, it is right that they should do so. It's respect. When we meet together to worship the Lord, I'm not going to suggest for a minute that we have any sort of strict dress code or an imposed period of silence or any outward ritual that must be observed on entering the building. But I do suggest that if we come prepared in our minds and hearts to meet with God, there will perhaps be evidence of it. Evidence of it in the way that we come, the way that we present ourselves. We will come with attitudes of respect, which will probably be visible. We wouldn't come in just in a completely casual manner, perhaps, as I say, I'm not suggesting any strict rules and regulation, but we are to come remembering we are approaching the Lord our God. Know that he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. Bit of a culture shock, isn't it, for many in our society? It's a uh, Many in our society tend to think of man, mankind, as the pinnacle of evolution. Mankind, man, woman, but man, the one who controls his own destiny. What are we to do for our destiny? And they hear the words of the Lord being the one who made us and not we ourselves and they might say what rubbish the bible describes man as created in the image of god it requires some explanation but for now i think that most people would think that the image of god as seen in us is manifested in we say behavior in love in goodness in mercy perhaps sometime in, in a, a holiness of living in justice and consideration and care the image of God would not include selfishness vengeance greed 
But what do we see in mankind? I dare to suggest that we see more of the latter, selfishness and vengeance and greed, than those other virtues that have been mentioned. Hardly any people really get on with each other in our societies when you get different groups of people. Most, if something annoys them, they will say, I'm going to claim my rights. And their rights is often the right to do something that offends others. So there is this conflict. We don't seem to hear of any claims in the law courts of them. Um, I wish to be allowed to be kind and considerate and helpful. It never go to court, would it? People don't go to that situation for that. When did we last read a headline about people requesting the right to do some kind work? For no fees, no expenses, just please may I have the right to be kind Society today would say, um, if you've got a screw loose, mankind urgently needs to get back to knowing who God is and how to respect him. How to respect his word and his person and especially the saviour, his son. Christians, God's own people, though, must not think of themselves above that warning. It is right in society to use the laws that are God given, but it is uh, ultimately we are to be gracious and willing to be put down, as it were, rather than saying, I am going to have my rights. Paul was correct in appealing to a Caesar. It was the legal right thing to do of the day, and he was being persecuted under Roman law. That was right. But there are also times when we must accept that we are not respected and we are persecuted. But we also must think of ourselves as uh, respectful of the Lord our God because of who he is. Who is he? He is the Lord God Almighty. We are not God's mates, as comes over in some professedly Christian gatherings. The Bible calls us the sheep of his pasture. Sheep. Yes, but why sheep? It seems to be a, a frequent comparison made in the Bible. But sheep themselves seem to have, we might say, little to make them something that we want to be like. You know, who, who would want to be like a sheep? Young people are more likely to say, I want to be like a famous footballer a great musician, a scientist. We don't hear people saying, I want to be like a sheep. It doesn't seem realistic. But in the Bible, the comparisons are made. And they are appropriate to make a comparison between Christians and sheep. What do we know about sheep? A sheep on its own is a lonely sheep. Sheep live in flocks. Christians need fellowship. I know individuals in a solitary confinement have the, like Paul, just the Lord is with me. But when possible, sheep, uh, Christians need fellowship. Sheep need a shepherd. I suppose there still are perhaps some, some wild sheep. 
But the analogy in the scriptures is with the domesticated variety, the cultivated sheep. And they do need to be guided. They need to be protected. They need to be retrieved when they have strayed from their fold. And these sheep know their shepherd. They know his voice. They know his manner. Do we know the shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep? Jesus said, he knows his own sheep and they know him. Do we respond to him by running to him, by keeping close to him? And do we flee from false shepherds when someone is trying to be teach us error? Do we flee from those who are trying to steal us away? The Lord is one, the one who is good to us. He preserves us. He upholds us. He is the one who is merciful. When we think again of a sheep, if a sheep has wandered and the shepherd has got them back, does he beat that sheep and say, what a wicked sheep you are? No, he grabs the sheep and he takes it back to the fold. The good shepherd, the good shepherd is also merciful. He brings the wanderer back. He restores it, he restores each one of us to that fold and there is rejoicing. The Lord is merciful to us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But again, that reminds us of our responsibility. If we confess our sins. Now I know we sin in ways that we don't even know, so we may say, well, how can I confess the sin that I don't know I've done? The Lord knows. He knows our heart. And if we come with a, a confessing heart, knowing that we need forgiveness. And there we can't take him for granted. In his mercy to us, sadly many do. Oh, people say, it's all right, it doesn't matter too much. Our God is a loving God, he's a forgiving God. But they omit the responsibility that we have to confess that we are not worthy of his mercy. We are sinful. We do not have sometimes the awe of God that this psalm speaks of. Verse 4 in the psalm says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Now this little room here is a, a women's institute hall. Is it? Physically that's what it is. And I know, of course, I know that God is not confined. And I know that the church is the people, not the buildings. But surely when we gather together, when we meet together, uh, assembling together in his name, as we do, reminds us that we meet in his presence. Symbolically, perhaps, symbolically, and just for a short time, this room becomes the place where the Lord meets his people. When we come into his presence, we come presenting ourselves inwardly, and outwardly, in ways respectful to him. So as we enter his courts, how should we come? We should come, we must come, with our hearts right with him. We must come with thanksgiving. 
We must come with praise. We must come with his name on our lips. Of course, I've said there's no code of dress, but how we come, our manner of coming, how we behave can reveal the feelings of our hearts towards him. Is coming to church just a way of filling an hour or so on a Sunday? Is it just a duty to be carried out just in case there is a God who wants us to do this? Or is meeting with the Lord's people the highlight of the week? When we can show before others and to others and with others our submission to God. A symbolic shout of allegiance. Yes, the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures. So let us, every time we meet, let us know both the joy of knowing these things that have been revealed to us and also know and experience the reverence that is due to him, that one, who is so above us that we can't literally express it. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you that you have revealed us to yourself to us. You have spoken to us through the prophets, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, inspiring your word. Help us as we dwell on these things in our hearts and in our minds. Help us to come close to you with joyful hearts, with thanksgiving, and with a sense of true reverence to the one that you indeed are, the Lord our God. So we come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.